Robots Radio. Games, lore, stories, community. Just press play. Welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast, the podcast where we explore the amazing universe of the Elder Scrolls. I was muted. I don't that know. Would be why I, 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 I forgot to unmute you. myself. Now that's the start to a show. That's the start to the show. Adventurers, welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast. This is your host, Tom or Robots, who sometimes forgets to hit unmute ourselves after the intro music plays. Uh, I am here with <laughs> Lotus of Doom. Lotus, buddy, how you doing, man? I'm great. I'm currently uh, unmuted. So <laughs> hey, we can hear each other. Yeah, well, I was going to say we got 50 percent firing on all cylinders, right? 50 <laughs> percent of the time we fire on cylinders on our whole cylinders, 100 percent of the time. That didn't Beautiful. even come out right. Love it. Yeah. Seamless. Perfect. All right. Crushed well, it. crushed it. I'm so I'm, I'm so excited to, to be back doing this. We, we had we you know, last week we were back with the patrons. Now it's back to you and me again. We're diving back into Daedric Princes, which is yeah. always a fun topic because there's always so much to cover. And for our specific Daedric Prince this week, her scene, there's a lot. There's a lot. You and I were chatting when we were getting ready for this episode and there's so much stuff now about her scene. Some of the Daedric princes show up occasionally. Her scene right. is, he's a super busy guy. There's a yes. lot to talk about. There, there's a lot of background on her scene. We've seen parts of her scene's realm of oblivion. We know what these her scenes interacts with be the player characters or NPCs throughout the game. Her scene's very fleshed out as a Daedric Prince compared to some of the others where you either need to look a little more for them or we're still waiting for there to be more involvement from them. Or they just tend to be a little bit more quiet and in the background yeah. and subtle. You know, yep. guys, guys are her, much her, more elusive. Her, me, her He's way more elusive. He's kind of hands right. off most of the time. Her scene is very pause on. Nice. P A W S, nice. not pause, like pause button. Um, because, I mean, let's just get into it. Her scene is the huntsman, the lord of the hunt, the master of beasts, and the master of the chase. And man, he shows up in basically every pantheon, either acknowledges his existence or worships him in some way. And if you are a lycanthrope, then he's definitely your lord and master and savior. <laughs> <laughs> whether so, you kind of want it or not, uh, it's, it's a little decisive whether it's a curse or a gift. Yeah. And there's, of course, there's different stories about people who seek it out and people who don't and what it means to be a werewolf or in some cases, other wear things. Yeah. That's wear stuff. Wear stuff like wear yep. boars. I mean, this goes all the way back to like the original first two games. Yeah. And you can be, um, what do you call it? I believe you're only ever allowed to be a werewolf or in Morrowind's expansion. I believe you might be allowed to be a werebear. And uh, Blood Moon. Yeah. I, in never, Blood I never Moon, played. Yeah, I'm pretty I sure only got so far a... into Morrowind, but yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I know you played don't everything. I really remember too, too much, but um, yeah, but then there's, you know, there's, there's other were creatures, like you said, were bats, which you will encounter in ESO, which I assume they're supposed to be the were bats that are referred to in this. I don't really necessarily know what can maybe makes things were related, but anything but yeah. were related, I'm willing to say has something it, to do with your scene. It, it, that's kind of my thought as well. And then, you know, you wear crocodiles, wear sharks and all these other things that are supposedly alluded to, but we haven't seen yet and sound equally horrifying. Yeah. I bet, I bet there's a Mayomer out there somewhere. That's like a wear shark. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Probably. But yeah. it's like a, remember that cartoon street sharks? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that That's was a product what of what the nineties shark. Is. That was like, that was like, that was like some boardroom somewhere. Some, uh, some, I don't know, 50 plus year old group of people in a boardroom were like, you know, it'd be really cool. You know, what kids like these days, they like skateboards and sharks. skateboards and being on the streets 
and talking cool things and sharks being, Why don't we just on the being on the streets you know like all that rap music is about being on the street you know you know what i'm talking about that's that's what exactly that's what, what i like. picture a wear shark being so yeah they've got a boom box on one shoulder yep really big teeth glasses and a skateboard mm-hmm Yep. That's yeah, that's it pretty much basically. So anyway, uh, her scene is the basically Lord of all the wear things, all the wear creatures. And in most of the time, well, I don't know if we can say most of the time, a lot of the time that is something that is sought out by people. A lot of time it's just a disease and then people become contract this, you know, wear problem and have to deal with it. Some people like it. Some people don't. We've got the companions, for example, from Skyrim, who are very big on the whole idea that they're werewolves. That's part of their identity. They they like the fact that that is that gives them power. And, right, right. You know, um, and this also ties into what happens when you die. And you know, I talk talk about this a lot. The Daedric princes have a reason for meddling with mortals and it seems that a lot of the time it's because they want to bring them to their realm of oblivion or at least their souls to their realm of oblivion and Hercene's specific realm is called the hunting grounds and we've seen it we've been there we've it's it's full of all sorts of creatures um there's there's a lot we can go into with the hunting grounds yes um it's as one of the places that you actually go to in game more than once. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely something that's a little more tangible. And the other thing about the, the hunting grounds is they're very, they're not, uh, how, how can I put this? They're not surreal. They're not bizarre. Like some of the other realms of oblivion. Mm-hmm. It's very much, it sounds like what it is. It's a forest. It's hunting grounds. It's very nature-esque. Um, they get a little odd at points uh, in ESO. There's the normal parts. And then it gets a little bioluminescent at points when, you know, you're going through the March of Sacrifices dungeon. That's part of his realm. But it, for the most part, it's a forest, although maybe it gets a little magical and chanty at points. And the sky to, to rob the princess's point which i was about to bring up the sky in there always looks amazing like yeah. just the sky boxes are extra incredible in in there yeah it's it's like a forest where everything's turned up to 11 yeah um, I mean, there's a bunch of creatures who are in this forest you know things like werebears and wild cattle and even unicorns um yep. the idea is that it is it is a hunting ground this is the it, place yeah. where if you if you are a were creature or you are a servant of her scene when you die you go here and if you die in the hunting grounds, like a second death, you're reincarnated again. It seems like on a daily cycle, maybe. And yeah, you kind of you kind of do this daily hunt. It, it's and for those who want to be the domineering, hunting, savage, beast like individuals where they go out every day and they enjoy the the fun of the hunt. This yeah. could be like a heaven in that case. Well, and to that point, which kind of brings us a little bit more with uh, some of the, the, the uh, you know, mantra to hear scene is just like you said, a lot of this can be like actually a positive thing. If you're if you're a hunter and you like the thrill of the hunt or more so you just like the idea of competition and challenge. Mm hmm. He is all about that. Um, and, and it as a side effect, because of that competitive spirit, it makes Hircine almost separated from some of the other Daedra Princes, in my opinion, where fairness and, and equ- he's probably the mon- although he can be pretty brutal, he's probably one of the most honorable, noble, like just not evil daedra of uh, of all of them like it's, it's like he has his thing and as long it, as you play by the rules of his thing right. like he will respect everything the is literally a game to him right right and we um, talked about that kind of with clavicus vile how he kind of plays games with people but that is way more on clavicus vile's terms it, it is whereas here scene it's all about like 
Hirsin does not like to lose because if you can best Hirsin, he will not be pleased, but he also kind of like, it's a, a respectful, like, all right, nice. You beat me. Like, I, I see what's up. He'll be a little irritated because he lost and he likes winning because of the competitive spirit thing. But at the same time, it's one of those things where even being frustrated that he might've lost something again, once we get into the data card effects, exactly what one of them is, it's basically like, Oh, props and here's my skin <laughs> yeah here's a reward <laughs> yeah right here's my, my so skin. like that's just it it's it's very when it you know with your scene you you don't really need to worry too much about trickery it's he's very straightforward very face value for the most part yeah yeah and i mentioned before it's in his realm it's like everything's turned up to 11 yep. and and that's because the the <laughs> the forest is not safe it has a bunch of savage creatures in it, bears and wolves and were creature, uh, we were creatures and Daedra. And th- even among the other things that you find there are what appear to be the ghosts of spirit animals from the mortal plane from Nern. Yep. And um, everything is, is basically focused around this idea of you are either the hunter or the hunted and sometimes you're somewhere in the middle because of everything that's going on right in the right. midst of you all this can be hunting one type of prey but being hunted by another type of prey which predator, happens predator, in right. the skyrim in daedric quest um so it's like you'll get into these weird scenarios as well yeah yeah and so it's it's interesting it if that's your thing then you're cool with that and if you get killed during the hunt then you get resurrected for the next cycle and then you go on with it now everything in the hunting grounds is also again raised to a you know 11 because everything's bigger these creatures are huge they're they're not just like you know regular wolves and bears and and even the daedra themselves the kinds of creatures he has in his realm are all just like i mean this is the, this is the challenge right. this is like hard mode <laughs> for your for your yeah, hunter pretty much yeah so it's it, he definitely controls this and then every night he comes out and does his thing and brings out his werewolves and he and his werewolves go on the hunt as well at you know once night falls and, sure. and then that resets the cycle once the night is over everything kind of resets the next day or at least it seems to that's that's the feeling i get from it that's something i kind of always got the the feel of as well um yeah i i would agree with that i would agree with that yeah so i mean there's a little bit more to it you can play through parts of of in the games so you can actually get into the um his realm it's the hunting ground specifically um and there's different looks during the days and different locations and a little bit of other stuff going on here it's every realm is a little bit more complex than just you know you can just boil it down to it's a forest but like you said there's so there's some different places one thing that it's it's kind of funny when we're trying to think of like as we had mentioned, there's a lot to here seeing, and I was trying to think of anything that might be useful to specifically bring up and I actually completely overlooked this and just re brought it back up because uh, it, it, it it's from one of the abstract in the series. Um, <laughs> but it, his realm, which is, is funny because we have mentioned the hunting and, and like the forest type of the deal before, well, not even before, because it was kind of simultaneous uh, because battle spire came out after Daggerfall, which was where here scene kind of first was introduced, existed type of deal. Um, but like right around this time, he hadn't really been solidified, I guess, as much because originally there is a weird sort of kind of crossover with here scenes realm and I guess what would come to be the Deadlands, um, because w- the final level of Battlespire, I guess, spoilers for Battlespire, uh, <laughs> all 11 of you who have beaten it, um, <laughs> who are still trying to finish it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the final level is actually called the Hunting Lodge of Maroon's Dagon. Um, mm. And prior to that and and we'll address uh the artifacts late later on uh when we get to his artifacts but prior to getting to the hunting lodge you need to collect artifacts which will then become artifacts for here however they're not related to here yet when 
they're introduced in Battlespire. So as a Daedric Prince, he's formulated more concretely over the years, but he started a little more nebulous because some of the parts of some of the other Daedric Princes and just world building seem to become what here seen is now in the series. Yeah. Like these proto ideas that were kind of pulled from other it, sources exactly, kind of exactly. came together in one thing and then became who yeah, we know now. And, and it's, it's interesting because the reason I mentioned the hunting lodge of Mirren's Dagon specifically, just because we're talking about the realm. It's funny because when you're, in there it is just the deadlands but you're going up this like spire thing and then the lodge is up at the top so it's kind of like a melding of both of these things and they eventually get split into two daedra princes which is just kind of cool to see how it's evolved over the years with him yeah yeah that's cool that's that's really cool because a lot of people don't ever go back and play those old games or at least don't play all the way through like they might shoot sure, them up to yeah, try this them is and literally then... the final level of the game so yeah. 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 <laughs> you got to be dedicated or really messed up <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really cool now one of the things that we um have more info on now since the last time i did an episode on her scene are the aspects of her scene and that's due to an expansion to eso that wasn't out what three right. three years ago when i originally talked about her scene so um there are a lot of things we might end up doing some other episodes in the future where we get into the worship of her scene from different cultures and some of the things that happen during different eras of the world and that kind of thing but for today's episode i thought it'd be really cool to talk on, on some of these aspects so um and this comes from the markarth dlc or expansion or whatever they want to call it to to the yeah. Skyrim expansion. I believe it, I believe it was ESO. referred to as a DLC yeah. for, for that one. It's the fourth quarter DLC was Mark Arth. But right. this is what we'll be referencing a lot for this. So if that's something you haven't done yet, definitely check out that expansion. Yeah. So according to what we learned there, the Reach folk, the, the people who live in the Reach, which we didn't oh, one or two or three episodes on Reachmen, um, but they believe that there are five aspects of her scene and uh each is worthy of its own uh reverence they, they kind of worship these um but it turns out that there might be more than that because the glenmoral weird remember the weird sisters the, yeah the weird w -Y -R -D. Y -R -D. not 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 weird as in like that's weird right right <laughs> these like nature nature worshipers um also worship the owl aspect so that's one of them so we're, we'll go through and, and highlight some of these so there's our uh, all rebeg who is known as the hunter in the aspect of guile so um he bears the spear of bitter mercy which we'll talk about later uh, when he manifests on occasion, he wields the spear of the hunter. He comes to Nern to hunt new prey or to bring prey native to the hunting grounds to the mortal plane. If he arrives without prey, then he has come to select a hare in his next hunt, which you don't want to be. Um, worshippers invoke our all all rebegs. I'm going to mess up all these names. Name it's, it happens when when praying for the bountiful hunt. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like you wanted to chime in with something. Uh, no, no, no. You're you're good. You're good. Continue. Okay. Then there's yeah. uh, store story story beg s t o r i h. It that seems good. <laughs> beg. Uh, the man beast, skin changer, skin shaper, king of wolves, wolf aspect of her scene, wolf that craved the sky, wolf with the Daedric Howl aspect of speed. Represents all of those things. And um, basically is the wolf. This wears, uh, he or it, wears the wolf skull totem. Um, it introduced the gift of skin shifting to mortals to remind them that they can be predators, not prey. So this aspect is the aspect that has the most to do with the whole turning into a werewolf or or any of that kind of stuff. But the skin changing in general is actually could be bigger than that, which is kind of interesting because there are other peoples in the world who also skin change. Right. So maybe there's something to do with that as well. Um, and then we have Urakanbeg, who is the great dark stag or just great stag. And he comes to mate with Heinz and may transform a mortal woman into one of this for the same purpose. Also, probably don't want to be on the end of that <laughs> deal either. He may also arrive to cull the herd of the weak. His hooves drum the blood summons that lure prey into his herd, which are then led into the hunting grounds where they meet their end. Some of his offspring have granted mortals the honor to ride them. <laughs> so 
this is the stag aspect, right? And when you think about her scene and the way her scene looks, he often has kind of that um, deer antler kind of head mask thing that he wears. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, this, the image of the stag is something that definitely uh, is a, is. <laughs> I mean, it's it's literally on his flag, like his emblem type of deal. So yeah. it, 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 that is very much his his feel um, when, it, you know, cosmetically going forward and stuff. Right. And then there's uh, Gulabeg, who is the quick fox. And um, he shares characteristics with some of the cultural interpretations of Lorcan, which is kind of interesting. Um, we know that Hercene and Lorcan are not the same person, but the fact that there might be some sort of connection there. Kind of cool. Uh, like Lorcan, Gulabeg is a trickster, and at worst, Gulabeg will deceive mortals into meeting their own demise or will use his swift bite to weaken his prey. He shows some parallels with Shore, Lorcan Shore. That's Lorcan is Shore, basically the same thing. Um, the Nordic interpretation of Lorcan, whose totem is the fox. So the fox connection there as well, both being the, the fox representing being sly and that kind of thing. So uh, Gulabeg's symbol is the Wand of Bone, which was fashioned from a shard from Lork's ribs and has the ability to confound any mortal. In one tale, a medallion associated with Gulabeg makes less conventional forms of communication understandable. Gulabeg is, all, is said to reward those he finds clever by teaching them tricks and secrets, which the Reachmen claim helped them survive the fall of Lork. So... It's interesting when some of these characters kind of butt up against each other because we've talked about mantling before and this right. idea that if you are too much like another thing and you take over its role, then you might actually mantle that role or that place or position. Right, right. Um, and that's it is it's it's very it's weird just because your scene has kind of formed out of like ideas from the rest of the series so it's also kind of interesting how that works as well in the formulation of here scene as a whole mm -hmm. it's almost like mantling the old ideas to become what is now here <laughs> scene as like a daedric prince in the series yeah yeah and i wouldn't go so far to, as to say that here scene has mantled Lorcon, and that, that that's like i don't think that that's really what's happening here i, I don't either the, the name is something similar uh actually brought up in chat by uh, by rob which was kind of funny was that in battle spire uh it, it was perfect perhaps um what is a conspiracy theory that may runes dagon used the razor to change his nimic and change uh, his nature to the prince and terribly took her scene stuff that's actually kind of funny because of how much here scene kind of should have been more involved with battle spire and it was all just attributed to dagon in that game <laughs> yeah maybe it was just a temporary thing right exactly so it, <laughs> it, it, again do i actually think that no but like it's just funny to think of it in that term because mantling is something in the series as well yeah yeah so the last one is <laughs> here we go Hrockabeg. The mighty bear in the aspect of strength. Harakabeg is the bear. He embodies strength and has ties to the totem of claw and fang. He comes to Nern seeking solitude, peace from labors, and renewal of the burning spirit within. He may bless those that make offerings of mead with the power of the bear heart. However, he will attack those who disturb his peace. Though he is slow, he makes up for it with his strength and tears his prey apart if he catches up to them. So, uh, if you come across Lorcan's bear aspect, leave him alone. He's on vacation. <laughs> this is like vacation aspect of her scene. <laughs> so, the, we won't go into too much more about this stuff. If you want to actually play through the Markarth DLC, you'll get to interact with pieces of this, which are pretty cool. You have any other thoughts on that stuff before we move on? No, I was going to say that that was a pretty good uh, synopsis of, of that. And and to your point, the Mark Arth DLC, which I do strongly recommend, I, it's it's a very good closing to the um, Dark Art of Skyrim, which involves Greymore as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the chapter of that year. Um, it's a good closure to that. And it's a I, I don't know. I thought that was an excellently done DLC because other than the reach folk being interesting to me personally, they did a really good job of giving them a much more fleshed out background. Um, yeah. Kind of, uh, you know, 
beyond just the association heresy in which we were talking about, there's a lot to be had from that DLC that I think added to the series. Well, there are connections to multiple Daedra and yes. Um, yeah. They, they uh, there's a lot going on there. Right, that's exactly it. A Daedric worship is something that the reach folk are fine with. It's not outlawed. It's not like this taboo thing that they won't do because who knows it? Oh, they're going to be terrible. It, it's, it's much more in the vein of, a lot of Dunmer where, where yeah. you know, that that's accepted to their culture. They're like, they're almost like the Dunmer spinoff equivalent of the Nords, like the Dunmer were to the. Sure, Altmer. sure, sure. Like that. Yeah. To, to like a, to a human equivalent type of thing. Right. To a Moorish equivalent. Right. Yeah. We're done. We're done with these other gods. They haven't done anything for us. We're going to go worship this, uh, this beast <laughs> right. guy over here. Let's see if we can get some actual uh, stuff to happen if we pray to them instead. Right. Which seems to be the case. I mean, in both cases, both with the Dunmer and with the, the Reachmen actually working along with the Daedra makes stuff happen. It may not always be what you want to happen, but stuff happens. They interact with the world. <laughs> that can't be denied, you know? Right. So, all right. So, cool. Well, you know what? Now's a good time for us to do the mid-break and right. thank our patrons. But we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about the the different uh, artifacts of her scene and um, some more stuff. So, uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. The skies are marked with numberless sparks, each a fire, and every one a sign. All right, here we are in the middle of the show. This is where I get to thank our newest patrons. And that includes, I'm looking through here, we got some new ones. Uh, I'm just gonna double check them some of these because I don't know if I actually thanked them in time <laughs> last week or not. I think I might've thanked Anthony B and Mags D. If I didn't, welcome, welcome Vord, thanks for signing up. And then Grug O and Jean-Francois Paget, maybe? It's got a fancy thing over the E, so maybe that's how you pronounce it. Um, also, Maxwell and some other people. More recently, we have, uh, or one more, uh, Raymond uh, W. So thank you to all of you guys for your support. Very, very much appreciated. And um, we have to call out every time Mr. Gami Boy and Noodle Al Dente, who are our Daedric Princes, because they are Tier 5 supporters and... Thanks so much for for being here, um, man. All eighty seven of you guys, thank you so much. And Rob saying yes, I did. Thank you. Well, you got a double thank you, Mags. So, uh, thanks a lot. Um, sometimes the date falls right on the same day as when we do the show, and I'm like, did I do it last time or not? And I'm too lazy to go back and just re-listen to the episode to find out. So, yeah, um, Patreon episodes a little more chaotic too because <laughs> it's a lot more than just me and you involved. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's a lot of fun though. Um, but if we're helping you get through your workday, your workout, your drive to work, your understanding of the games and your enjoyment of them, or anything else, then go to patreoncom slash lorecast and check out the different series. You can get ad-free episodes. You can join us on future episodes of the show. You can get T-shirts, and the T-shirts are all designed around the Daedric princes um all sorts of cool stuff so go check that out and um uh, we just love your support also uh another way to help us out would be to leave a rating and review on apple podcasts which we don't have any new ones this week but thank you to everybody who takes the time to leave a rating and if you do leave a review with some words i will read it out in the future and then also you can leave ratings on spotify if you listen there or if you have an account for either of those and you just want to go out of your way to just drop a rating or a review in there even if that's not your main place where you listen to the show that's also extremely helpful so thank you to everybody who does that all right that's all we got for the mid-break this week let's get on with the rest of the show yes yes you're entirely brilliant conquering madness and all that blah 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 all right so lotus her has got a few artifacts huh <laughs> her scene does has a few <laughs> does does has does have a few artifacts we are we are the best uh, with words we We're so you know good. If, if it's a good thing podcasting doesn't require us to know how to speak very well yeah uh, you know what i <laughs> bet if we recorded this not at the end of the day like like late at night like yeah well it's not that, that might late, help but, the amount of times yeah. that i have enough time to eat shower and then sit down uh -huh. <laughs> so right. that we re can record are more than i would like to admit so. yeah it's been it's already been a long day by the time we're, we're doing this so but thank you I, to um, everybody who puts up with our terrible yeah, speaking little mumbliness um <laughs> What do you call it? Yeah. So 
here scene definitely does and yet again i'm going to do a couple battle spire polls as we go through this Ooh. because some of these are not always hear scenes or they become hear scenes there's actually a few that get a little weird so all right well why don't you why don't you throw one out there which one do you want to talk right. about first why don't we start with um we'll, we'll kick things off with the savior's hide mm, okay. uh, that's probably the most well known yeah and kind of gross but yes and gross and gross yeah <laughs> uh -huh. definitely definitely gross um do we want to talk about the well-known version or do you want me to just do the weird link to battle well, let's, let's to start, start let's with. start with the well-known one and then we can get weird do the weird divergent yeah. all right yeah. sounds good so um so the savior's hide is also known as the scourge of the oath breaker and also known as her scenes hide because it's, it is her scene. Because well, it's literally his hide. Her scene's hide. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the Savior's Hide once referred to a full set of an armor known as the Armor of the Savior's Hide. It include boots, included boots, a cuirass, gauntlets, greaves, helmet, and pauldrons. Over time, the term Savior's Hide would become predominantly used to refer to the cuirass of the Savior's Hide, so just the chest piece. And the rest of the armor set have not been seen since the third era 399. So I guess it's been a little while if we're up to date with things that happened in Skyrim. And specifically, this makes you resistant to magic. You basically put on Saracen's <laughs> skin and you're protected from magic. Ta -da. Right? Ta da. There you go. Yep. Doing it. It's actually a pretty, uh, I don't know. I've always thought it was a pretty cool looking piece of armor, even though it's kind of gross just assuming like i'm not assuming he takes it off and fashioned it into like pelt armor so much as just peeled it off and is like here you go and throws it at you like a coat with a really <laughs> gross sticky inside <laughs> oh man i bet it's i bet it's warm too <laughs> yep oh, so that's God. that's what i picture but which is gross which is gross um but yeah in game i was gonna say it's definitely pretty neat uh there's obviously the well-known skyrim quest uh, where you can get it and actually there's a way that you can do both choices and get the savior's hide if you're very very careful on your decision making during that quest cool, cool. yeah so um there's a few different stories, uh, origin stories. One of these actually includes Malakath. Is that the one you were going to talk about? It's not. Because um, that's interesting, in, too. It, th this one is... So, you know what? All right, hold on. We'll this is where I'll jump in with this one, because it's kind of weird, and then we can go into the origin stories that I think become canon, because I don't uh -huh. know what the deal is. as much. So, the Savior's Hide is actually six separate pieces um like mentioned before where it, it originally had other pieces well in battle spire you have to go around the chimera of desolation which we won't get into it is a very dark story from from battle spire um but you have to go around and you have to collect these pieces these pieces are also not unique in this game <laughs> it's oh. just like here's a daedric glove and some elven boots and they're just it's just a hodgepodge of items okay um, so you can find multiples it, of them it's so they also break the rules of the game which i actually thought at one point i was going to doom myself going into uh battle spire clueless when i played through you can take ability or i i, I guess ability a an inability to use certain types of armor. It will give you points elsewhere, but you're incapable of using certain things. Okay. So I made my character completely inept with all weapons. I could only fist fight. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'll just, I can't use Daedric. That, that's what I'll do. And I picked up a piece. Uh, I believe it was the shoulders. Um, and because it's a quest item that you need. It breaks the rules and lets you just put it on anyways, which is great because huh. I didn't do myself with a weird save error. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was not, you're collecting it for, uh, I believe it's old man. Kai, Kai, Kimer uh, is a strange line. Kamir, sorry. Old man. Kamir um, is who you're collecting them for. And there's no reference point to here seen in the collection of the armor. It's just armor. That's going to protect you. Same thing. It gives you magical resistance and stuff like that. But 
that really was like the uh, I don't know old origin story of it where it was just kind of like yep here's some armor pieces they're super magical sounds pretty good because it will save you i.e. the savior's hide huh. um, and then it seemed like it became which we can go into now a little more of you know how how the origin stories make a little more sense than an old man in a lost village <laughs> right right so the the most well-known tale is the one where it, it's a reward to the first mortal who escaped the hunting grounds and this is the one where you're talking about where he basically her scene basically peeled off his own hide and gave <laughs> yeah. it to him as a reward super gross Super um, gross. <laughs> super gross. Another another theory claims that it was actually sewn from the hide of a werewolf by her yep. scene. Um, but then there's the one about Malakath. And this story comes from a book called Tal Morag's. I'm sorry, Tal. We're so good at names today. Tal Morag Kerr's <laughs> Researches. And this book was from Morrowind and then also shows up in Elder Scrolls Online because they like to pull in all the old books from all the other stuff. And. Um, Basically, it details a few different things, but there's one place where it talks about the armor of the Savior's Hide specifically, and it says here, created by the Daedric Lord Malakath, this armor has the marvelous property of turning the blow of an Oathbreaker. Keimer tricked Dagon into swearing an oath against the powers which he had no intention of keeping. The hide of the savior turned Dagon's titanic fury long enough for Keimer to deliver his own attack. So this seems like it has a connection to Keimer, right? Like yes. same, same person you talked about. Yep. Um, an incarnation or I'm sorry, incantation invoked upon Dagon's protonymic. So incantory true name is yeah. what that means. So the, all right. So it, uh, good. This does tie in yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, like many of Mal Malakas gifts, the armor is a mixed blessing. It also makes us wear exceptionally vulnerable to magic attacks. So one should only wear it for particular occasions. So which is which is funny because in game uh, <laughs> you also like it's way better than any of my armor <laughs> like it's just straight up like it because of it being made of a hodgepodge of materials it's like oh yeah it's got the magic part, but it, it just straight up is better and protected me way better than my like actual gear uh -huh. so its detriment did not matter whatsoever it's well just it, it seems like it effect. might actually even be uh either an inaccuracy that was accidentally put in there or it something be. because it seems many. like the yeah it seems like the actual item itself in the game might still protect you from magic right even though the lore claims it won't <laughs> yeah because that's what i was gonna say like in game it absolutely does but that's the benefit of like i have daedric i have dwemer i have like these mm -hmm. armor or these material types of armor in the coding of the game work like this yeah so without some type of extra thing that they would put on it, it wouldn't work. It would just outright be better, even if they didn't mean to be better. Right, right. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to another one. Which one do you want to cover next? Um, why don't we? This one's pretty simple. So why don't we do the Ring of Here scene next? Because okay. the Spear of Bitter Mercy and the Spear of the Hunter, to a lesser extent, that one's another really good one where it's going to have some weird tie-in stuff and evolution. Sure. Okay. So let's do. Uh, so the the ring of Hercene, also known as Hercene's ring or the Hercene ring, is a Daedric artifact created by, of course, Hercene himself. Uh, in appearance, it is usually an engraved metallic ring showing the head of a wolf. Although it has also been known to appear as a spiked leather buckler. That's like that's a shield. Yeah, <laughs> not a ring, a shield. That, Two very yep, different that's types of not objects. The same thing. <laughs> not the same thing. The ring can temporarily give off uh, the gift of lycanthropy to the wearer. Um, so if you put this on, basically you can become a werewolf and allows lycanthropes to control their transformation. So if you already are a werewolf, now you have full control over it, which some do, but but a lot of them don't. Lycanthropes who possess the ring are not affected by the moons or by bloodlust and can change form at will. Her scene punishes those that did not legitimately earn the ring, stripping the ring from its ability to control transformations and instead make transformations unpredictable. 
For non-lycanthropes, the ring is often useless. Although it has been known to extend the wearer's life and allow for transformation into a werewolf, the ring is known to affect werewolves and werebores and likely works on other ly- lycanthropes as well. So, seems like a very useful item if you happen to be a werewolf. And if not, right. may or may not do things for you, depending on her scene's mood at the time or the way the game was coded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So that's that's her scenes ring. Um, you want to dive into the spear of bitter mercy? Why don't you take this? one? Yeah. So. So. All right. So the spear of bitter mercy is very interesting. Um, there's also a thing referred to as the spear of the hunter, mm-hmm. um, which we, we'll, we can do that really quick because it's, it's just way more simple. Little- yeah. yeah, it's very, very simple. Uh, the little snippet uh, provided by UESP is the Spear of the Hunter is an artifact associated with and often wielded by the Data Prince here seen. That is a floral pattern adorned on its spearhead. So pretty. Which, yeah, it's very, it's very, exactly. He it's, loves it's, his it's flowers. Very, it's a very pretty death, um, which also has a cross piece that curves downward on one end, like uh, another spear associated with here seen, the Spear of Bitter Mercy, which we're about to get into. Mm-hmm. Little is known about it. Um, and the spear is one of the more mysterious artifacts, blah, 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 interior lore. But yeah, the spear of the hunter almost seems like the less well thought out version of the spear of bitter mercy, yeah, which or, has a little more of a background to it. Or like a, pro- so, a proto version of this. This came from blood. Moon, exactly. It and could, it could be the preliminaries or it could be something that we find out more about later down the line in the series. It's like, Oh no, there actually are two spears or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They just didn't, finish doing more with this one right yet. they yeah. started with they, one and it didn't happen to be this one <laughs> they do look very different though i mean as, as different as two be, spears can look this one has the yes. floral pattern on the the spike at the front it's got a main spike a secondary spike that comes off let's say the top and then on the right. bottom there's a like a spike that curves backwards yes. almost like it's, if you were to jab this into somebody you would use that to then tear more things out it's of them. actually a very cool spear it almost as much of a spear as it is when it, you can look this up on the unofficial Olive scrolls pages they have literal vision like visual to go with us yeah the people he's trying to describe these <laughs> right. um but it has a very similar um feel to like a halberd or something like that where it's a flat it's not so much it, it's a very elaborate spear as it's curved in both directions with with like again like a, a way to pull mm-hmm. back after slashing forward or jabbing forward right right whereas the spear of bitter mercy which we'll tackle next um it, it appears to have like multiple uh blades facing forward and back so there's the main spear at the front and then right. there's like four prongs of spears that are behind it so yep. I mean, it definitely looks like something you don't want to take a hit from in the chest with <laughs> no this. not really no, not at all yeah so um you want to tackle this one too? Uh, sure. Um, so the Spear of Bitter Mercy is an artifact uh, that is an enigma to Tamaralians, uh, but many believe uh, it is to be of Daedric origin. And again, since since it's wielded so frequently by Hircine, I mean, one would be prone to assume as much. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes things can be crafted outside Um Perfect example, Volendrung, very Dwemer in construction, uh, but at the same time, it was adopted by Malakath, so it's Malakath's item, so to speak. Um, however, multiple spears of bitter mercy may exist, which is also very interested, and this is going to be where it ties in a little bit to Battlespire and Mayrun's Dagon again. Originally forged by Mayrun's Dagon, it has become the signature weapon of his ally, Hircine, which is interesting because yeah later in the series there isn't a lot of reference to them being allies um right it almost seems like i i, I guess daedric princes fight with each other with each other as much as they they cooperate so who, who knows maybe this is just a, a time and place type of deal um what was i gonna say oh uh but either way uh it's it's here seen who has become most closely associated with the spear. One of his yeah. titles uh, given to him with, 
Ugh, was by the reach fo- by the reach folk is the spear with five points which is like um, what i described before so which this is, ex- is that's exactly it if, so if when they are it is, yeah when they're describing when they say the fear of spy, uh, spear of five points what they're actually describing most likely is the spear of bitter mercy right right um there's there's a reference to at one point shia goroth is actually also in control of the spear but it seems as along with many things with shia goroth it was almost stolen for the sake of amusement (laughs) and and (laughs) most of things associated with shia goroth um however this is the point that, that i'm glad that there's a specific part about this which is the battle spire reference that i really wanted to make reference to mm-hmm. uh, Marin's dag dagon imbued the spear with the power to use in the ritual of innocent quarry which is a it's a quest slash it's it's a literal temple found on the chimera of desolation which is the fifth level i mean yeah fifth level of elder scrolls battle spire um this enchantment consists of a powerful and malevolent uh, energies capable of instantly killing all but the high Daedric lords. Um, so that's pretty potent. It, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty lethal. Um, thus, it is forbidden from being removed from the site of the Great Hunt, which, just as a side note, the Great Hunt takes place on this chimera. In, in battle spire that's where you basically get dropped into you are one of the prey in that game uh being hunted and until you gra- until you grab it problems abound um the other <laughs> the other side effect of this is it cannot be wielded by any mortals or immortals except those sanctified to the hunt and bound to its rules because dagon twisted his pact with uh Kamir, which is which is old man Kamir. This is his actual name. I didn't actually realize I said yeah. his full name. Gregan. Kim, yeah, Kamir Gregan. Interesting. Uh, an unsanctioned wearer of the uh, armor of Savior's uh, unsanctioned wearer of the armor of Savior's hide can also bear the spear, and the armor's enchantment offers protection against it. So basically, you can. I guess that's its a way of being game magical. It. Yeah, you can gain if you have the Savior's hide, then you can also use the Spear of Bitter Mercy. Right. Which is might it might be because well think about it. If that's actually made out of Hercene's skin and you put it on, then maybe the spear doesn't realize that you're not Hercene. You know, maybe that's the case. I didn't know Hercene was made of Dwemer Elven and Daedric chunks, but (laughs) But, well, you know But who knows? Who knows? (laughs) Who knows Um, what he's been slapping on his skin in order to keep it nice and young looking i don't know um danger do weird crap man (laughs) as yeah they do (laughs) so as a gameplay aside to this little segment uh because this was the part i really did want to make reference to was you have hern and they're the kind of original versions of the fire daedra and frost daedra which they're much more humanoid in battle spire Mm -hmm. the the atronox yes the atronox they they straight up talk they they wear armor um it's they're very different than they became later in the series Mm -hmm. um they're not they're not they're aspects of flame and ice or whatever i believe is the technical thing from the game but it's kind of splitting hairs um but yeah, you're dropped in as prey in this whole scenario. And like it mentions, you grab the pieces that allows you to get the spear because if you actually, tr- you can fight the underlings that are just kind of roaming around, having fun, torturing and murdering stuff. Of course. But there are herns, which are another Daedra creature roaming around and they just are straight up invincible to you until you get the spear of bitter mercy. Uh, and then you're allowed to just one shot them, um, which is super satisfying because that is a rough level. It is very large. And it's one of the few times I will say in gaming where I was really, really pumped when I got this thing because it was like, this had better be as awesome as it seems like it is. And it totally is. You uh, get to just, you lay waste to everybody with that thing. And it is really, really satisfying because for anybody who's played Battlespire, it is a 
difficult game to say the least yeah but then all and, of a sudden uh, you're on easy mode once you get yeah, this thing. when you get that thing it's because again you're terrified of these invincible creatures and it actually does give you that power back when they when you find them you just one little swing and it's deletion so yeah it's uh it's a very cool artifact and it's it, it it's almost like a artifact that might be known with your scene but it almost seems like it bounces around so much it's looking for real owner as opposed to yeah. really being his well one of the possibilities is that it was forged by mayroon's dagon exactly. and has now come into hercene's possession and he's kind of claimed it or there are multiple of them so which it could be very foggy here as or to, a combination of all of those <laughs> right right and we, you know, was there an original and then the copies were made you know like what's actually going on with that um now yeah. this also connects to the reachman so according to the reachman myth her wields this the spear of bitter, bitter mercy when he takes on the aspect of al rebeg the hunter who we mentioned mm-hmm. before um it is one of the symbols of the five aspects and another four being totems of her composed of three artifacts and the totem of claw and fang which we're gonna talk about in a second yep. the weapon grants its wielder a magical shield as well as the ability to summon storm atronox so in this version of the spear it right. it does this right <laughs> totally different from before right so is it the same spear maybe it is who knows maybe right. it just got different enchantments over time um in appearance it is a metallic spear usually with two or four protruding prongs surrounding the central spearhead so even the shape and the, the look of it has changed right it is sometimes emblazoned with daedric heckam sigils uh representing the letter h for yep. Hercene. Much like other artifacts associated with Hercene, it rejects a user who is unworthy to wield it. So in this version of the myth, this is the way the spear works. But, you know, again, is it because things change with time? Is it because each of the games just kind of revised what the thing actually did just for gameplay reasons? You know, who really knows? Right. So then we have totems. So there is the totem of claw and fang, which is a religious artifact to the reach folk and the skull and is a necklace that is decorated with the claws and fangs of a great bear actually looks pretty cool you've got like the little like the next little claws and fangs hanging down right the um the reach clans believe it is the symbol of crocobeg hercene's bear aspect so this specifically represents <laughs> hercene on vacation <laughs> it is one of the symbols of the five as- aspects and uh, of course like we talked about before the other four being the spear of bitter mercy and then the three other totems which we'll mention in a second. The skull associate it with the spirit bear, which they summon by invoking powerful nature magic with the totem, which is then tracked down and killed by the skull to please the all maker during the restog, which is one of their big events. Mm -hmm. Um, So now is this connected with a spirit bear or is that spirit bear also here seen? Are they one and the same? (laughs) Right. Right. Was that where so her scene on vacation and showed up for the skull and they were like, oh, spirit bear is here. And her scene's like, ah, crap. All right. I'll do like, the thing oh, now. Yeah. Like, how does that play into it? Who yeah. really knows? And then there are the other totems of her scene, which, of course, are ancient artifacts predating men's ability to write, speak or properly think. According to this article, <laughs> they are just three of the symbols of the five aspects. Of course, the other two were the Spear of Bitter, Mer- Bitter Mercy and the Totem of Claw and Fang. The yep. Wolf Skull skull Totem, also known as the Totem of Fear, is an engraved and feathered wolf skull that is said to have been used by shamans in blood ceremonies to create lycanthropes. It's, it augments a wolf, a werewolf's presence, making people cower in fear, save for those that have caught a glimpse of Hercene's face. I don't know about you, but in the presence of any werewolf, I would probably be cowering in fear. That yeah, that's not really high on my list of things to to want to encounter. <laughs> right? So I, I can't see myself being like, yeah, no, this is totally fine and not unnerving whatsoever. That thing doesn't have a high percentage chance of just killing everything in front of it, including yeah, myself. Instantly. Yeah. Right. Um, it is said to be worn by Storybeg, the man beast, the wolf aspect of her scene, whose uh, so I'm sorry, whom similar to his wolf skull totem is credited among the Reachmen with introducing the gift of skin shifting to mortals. And we talked about that before. Yep. Then there's Arikan Beg, who we mentioned, the stag aspect of her scene with whose hooves beat the blood summons that lure prey into his herd, which are then led to the hunting grounds. We talked about that before, right? And yep. so 
Urikenbeg. I'm, I'm probably totally maiming that name. It's Urikenbeg, maybe? Um, is I don't know. I, yeah, Rick and Beg sounds fine to me. <laughs> <laughs> is represented through the totem of the Brotherhood, a mundane drum whose beating does the blood call, which allows the summoning of packed members or the calling of prey to hunt. So not only does the stag draw in the prey, it then has this totem, which also draws the pack to come hunt the prey. So the two yep. are like just kind of inherently entwined there um then there's gulabeg symbol the wand of bone which is also known as the totem of the hunt which was fashioned from a shard from lork's ribs and has the ability to co-found to confound any mortal it was used as a medicinal wand in an ancient brotherhood and is believed to heighten a lycanthrope's sight and smell making it hard for a prey to flee again don't they already have like total awesome it it spell? seems like they have enough bonuses but just specifically with that one that i find i find that it's funny that it's like it heightens the senses of the hunter and the mortal gets confused at the same like right. how many i right. feel like that's you're like, totally okay, screwed. You too many buffs yeah <laughs> somebody yeah. nerf this yeah not only do you not even know where to go to get away but the things will definitely find you no matter where you go anyway <laughs> exactly. so good luck um and w- for every time we've mentioned lork l-o-r-k-h this episode yeah. that is the reachman's version of lork right so think of it as regional dialogue for dialogue right. for uh Lorcan. Yeah, usually enough. usually when a, a name sounds very similar, it's just one yeah. group's version of that same thing. Right. Um, right, right, right. Usually. Uh, so the other thing here is that it, if this was actually fashioned from one of Lork's ribs, that's pretty freaking amazing. I mean, is this like is this like real world um, totems and things where we're like, oh, this is the hand of St. Larry. It, and it's right. been in this. I don't think there was a St. Larry, but, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's been in this <laughs> good old St. <Saint> Larry. <laughs> it's been in this uh, temple in the middle of, you know, the desert in Spain since, you know, 450 BC yeah, or whatever. I don't know. I'm just making it's crap great. up. But is, is no, this like that <laughs> where, where they, they just found that's a rib canon. and they were just like, ah, we'll call this the totem of the hunt. Yeah, it's like perfect. This has got to be Lork's rib. <laughs> right. Or is there just a deeper connection here? Because we talked about right. the the fox symbol, um, the connection to Lorcan, maybe claiming a piece of Lorcan's body was something Harrison did at one point? Kind of. Who knows? We, yeah, we, that, we know Lurkan had a heart. Right, right. So it's like that would lead you to believe that there's more Lorcan floating around potentially. <laughs> just every, everyone's got the Lorcan for Everybody's everybody. Just grabbing chunks of Lorcan. I got Lorcan's <laughs> fingernail. That's cool. Yep. I got a butt hair. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> What's the butt hair do? I, I don't know yet, but. <laughs> But I don't, I don't think I want to keep I'm, it near the food. I'm just, I'm just going to pass it down to my children. Um, it's staying in the family. So I I don't know how all that stuff works, but it's pretty cool stuff. This whole totems yep. thing got fleshed out. It, I believe it started in Morrowind and we got more details in the most recent. Yeah, I believe. Uh, ESO stuff. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Um, so that's that's some cool stuff. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff we could talk about which i mentioned before we're going to save there are some other things that happen throughout the eras there are interactions between hercene and other daedric princes which uh, i know you want to talk about when we get to shia right once we get to shia gorath that's a really good story but it's much more shia gorath than it is hercene exactly right and then there's the different ways the different groups of peoples interact with hercene and the way they, right. they worship him and the things that he's done or to help or hinder them uh, there's all that other stuff we'll save that stuff because i think this would be something that we definitely need to put on our list to come back to when we talk about some of this like deeper sure and i mean like it, it's hard to cover every little aspect of uh, some of these things so it's like this is just this is certainly a deeper dive i think than before but at the same time this is like you know this this is a a decent overview but i mean you can look into some of the stories and stuff like that and like you said the the impact on different cultures you can go on and on but it's like we don't want to drone on for hours and just yeah, <laughs> in yeah. people with every possible thing we can think of either right well are you ready for some fun uh, little bits of trivia here there, there isn't oh. a ton i've got one really interesting fact and then i've got two voice actors to talk about 
Okay. So <laughs> at first I thought you were going to say I have one interesting fact and two not so interesting. Two, two really <laughs> lame facts. <laughs> so um, the name Hercene itself, the word means of or pertaining to or resembling a goat. All right. So if you were like you, that's uh, uh, th- thanks for introducing me my to your girlfriend the other night. She's kind of hair scene, isn't she? <laughs> that would not be a compliment. Yeah, or or <laughs> or you could refer to it as a goat, and it's like greatest of all time. Ah, there's a, like <laughs> even one step further. So, Man, yeah, your girlfriend's so, a total goat. Yeah, exactly. Excuse me, you just told her scene. Excuse me, you know, <laughs> goat, greatest of all yeah. time. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, just I'm, requires more levels of explanation so you don't get punched in the mouth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think she's awesome too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so hair scene means resembling goat, which is kind of related to the whole like anthropy thing. Although he yep. doesn't really look goat like. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he doesn't have the goat vibe so much as like the stag vibe. <laughs> right. Right. So so there is that. Now in Blood Moon, the voice actor was Jonathan Bryce, and Jonathan Bryce is primarily a video game voice actor, not so much a tv actor those kinds of things and um hasn't done a whole lot in the last decade or so but was uh acted in a few different actually was a production assistant for a few different shows and then before that a voice actor up until about 2007 so i guess maybe he's just not in the industry anymore but maybe most of what he has done is elder scroll stuff so uh, miscellaneous characters male argonians khajiits uh nords um, this is in Morrowind and then in Blood, Blood Moon, he's here seen. Um, and he's also coursed Wind Eye and Tharston Heartfang, if you remember those. Um, and then also the other games that he's most recognized for are Star Trek games. So Star Trek Legacy oh, and Star Trek Conquest. Again, these games are now 15 years old because this is like 2006, 2007. I'm aging away as we speak. Yeah. So there's that. Um, but the other voice actor who is now currently doing hair scene. I would admit, yeah, the current hair scene. The current one is Craig Seckler or Setchler. I don't know if it's a it's CH, so I don't know how to pronounce that. But um, Craig seems to have been doing a whole bunch of different things. Voice acting, acting, narration, all sorts of stuff. So uh, most recently is the narrator for Nova, the TV show. Uh, I was about to say the TV show. Yeah, the docu series. Yeah, Nova oh. was pretty. So here scene, pretty legit. Yeah, I was going to say so here scene uh, narrates Nova. Interesting, I didn't realize that. Yep. Also, the narrator in uh, Return to the Moon, and um, was the narrator on the TV series Drain the Oceans Deep Dive. So it's like he does all these a lot of these like naturey, sciencey kinds of shows. Um, the Pacific War in Color also. Uh, voice voices and probably narrator for um, but then you have the video game stuff which actually wasn't a whole lot but a pretty regular staple for Bethesda games Skyrim uh, Fallout 3 uh, Fallout 3 Broken Steel uh, is Mr. Stiggs uh, in regular Fallout 3 Butch Deloria Harkness and Billy Creel so if you remember those characters <gasps> Okay. Yeah, a couple of them, a few of I that doesn't sound familiar, but interesting. Yep. In Skyrim, Gallus Decidenius, Periite, and Hercene. Oh. And then, um, let's see, in the Shivering Isles expansion to Elder Scrolls IV was Count Syrian, uh, Errol, and Halion. Hmm. Which I don't remember by name. I'll have to play that again. Yeah, I don't let's remember where they're placed. Mm-hmm. If- for some reason i think the count is from uh mania but i'm not entirely sure of that like the it mania might be. side yeah it might be um i because I, I, I yeah i think i think it was a duchess on dementia's side i don't know it's been a, it's been a while so i could be remembering that incredibly wrong and then uh in uh regular elder scrolls for oblivion the high uh, chancellor akado falcar and alval uvani hmm. if you remember those characters so voiced many different characters across Elder Scrolls. And then before that, just a lot of different acting credits and um, has been in the industry since 1959. Holy crap. Yeah. Mario Galovin uh, was a TV movie and he was somebody named Trotello. Trotolo? 
I don't know. Of course. Well, I don't know. How could I forget? He was eight years old <laughs> at this point. So he's wow. been acting, I guess, since then. So this uh, is just his whole life. His whole life. Yeah. Acting, voice huh. acting, uh, narration, a bunch of stuff. So interesting because he's a lot of these people that we talk about, they have a long series of like video game credits and then they might right. have some other stuff. He has lots of other stuff and then he's occasionally just, yeah, he's, does video games. Right. He's, he's all over the place in, in media. Yeah. Yeah. So cool stuff. I always like digging into who the character voices are. And, and yeah, I, I enjoy that too. Cause some of the out of lore stuff I think is also interesting sometimes where it's just like, Oh, how, you know, how, why did this come about? Or who is this that actually does this person? Yeah. So I think that's all we're covering for her scene today. But there's lots of other stuff. hersine has been doing stuff in the lore since the first era, probably before that. In Marithic era, there's some rumblings. The second yep. era, of course, with Elder Scrolls Online, and then, of course, all the events from Oblivion and, and Skyrim and Morrowind. Uh, which and as a series, later. it's always adding more. That's the benefit of a still active series. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more about him in the three years now since i originally did an episode about hair scene especially this whole aspects thing that that's really come out and is mm-hmm. different and w- i also find that kind of interesting because i'm trying to think are there other daedric princes that have aspects in this way there are some that represent themselves differently sure but this specific like it's like there's six different sides to his personality or aspects that he manifests as, which seems complex and interesting, but it also, it also makes you wonder if he's some sort of amalgamation of other things that all came together into one being. Sure. Which, which is interesting because like, I guess kind of almost that, that kind of leans a little bit into the fact that like some of his uh, things have, um, sort of formed out of other things so like maybe that's that's part of it um and actually as as the prince has brought up the, the good data technically they have their anticipations which is a little different but I, I totally get that the other thing um which we haven't gotten to i was gonna say there's J- jigalag and shao right split right but they're so not they, really aspects so much as no comp- now, now they've kind of been torn apart but th- there right. is the aspect of mania and dementia which is we'll get we'll get into obviously much more shigor the other one that'll I, I think will be interesting is when we tackle mayrun's dagon the ally in this situation as we referred <laughs> to ally. from here so yeah i was gonna say big quotes on ally there um but <laughs> we actually found um with the gates of oblivion last year and we were you know some so we got sent those coins type mm-hmm. of thing yeah and there were the different aspects of mayrun's dagon where it was his ambition his destruction and ironically creation is like a thing with it's, with him it's similar Lesser to known like C- siwa in the um the hindu yeah yes exa- yeah, exactly, um, exactly this idea that you have to cr- destroy in order to recreate something to, to recreate new. exactly yeah. um so there's that so it'll be interesting as we keep going to see if anybody else mimics this idea of of like the parts that make up the whole rather than just one for lack of a better word gimmick to do the daedric prince yeah yeah, I enjoy it because it, it, it really fills it out some more. So, But that's what we got this week, guys. We'll be back next week with another Daedric Prince. We're going through alphabetically. Who's who's next on the line? Daedric Princes. I can't remember alphabetically which one comes next. Let's see. Uh, after her scene is Jigalag. Ah. So maybe we tackle Jigalag and Sheogorth since they're so tied together. Or we could skip over Sheogorth and go to Malakath interesting you know we might need to leave this as a teaser because i know jiggleg isn't nearly as fleshed out but shiagorath is massively fleshed out it's true it's true so maybe we do a, a little episode on jiggleg and just kind of cover that aspect of yeah Shiagorath. i bet with a little work we could probably find enough with jiggleg um mm-hmm. but he's definitely not one of the most prominent princes as he's 
on the brink of non-existence at points. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, so there's also kind of that. Um, so mm-hmm. we'll, yeah, that one might be interesting to see. Uh, it'll either be maybe a little shorter of an episode, or we might be able to find up enough on him and his connection to Shagorath without going hog wild into Shagorath territory, which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is definitely wild and full of yeah, cheese. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be cover. We'll figure it out. We'll cover up some. some we'll cover one of these topics next week. Um, yeah. Lotus, uh, I, I know you've been doing some cool stuff. You want to share what else you've got? Um, going on? Yeah, I was going to say, we are still recording Tales of Tamriel. Um, I've continued to upload uh, all the dungeon stories on Dungeon Tales, uh, which I, I actually don't know if we've managed to do this since you did. Uh, shout out to you, uh, oh, <laughs> because thanks. I love the artwork you made for my cover pages. Uh, uh-huh. You would be the one responsible for the cool cover art that I put over the very, very pretty <laughs> um screen you know the thumbnails for all the videos yeah i all of my designs looked like butts and you managed <laughs> to come up with one way better way faster and i was like this is great this is exactly what i envisioned and you did it in like four minutes yeah i was like hey i could do a thing to help you out and you're like yeah it's fine when you get time and i was like boop boop, boop here you go yeah, was, and you're like what like, how did you dude, do that I, I literally didn't even finish my sandwich and this is done how are you so fast at this <laughs> it's just how, so that's been a lot of fast. fun um I, I was away at PAX East, which was why I was MIA the show before. Yeah. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of people. No Bethesda stuff or Xbox stuff there because it was still restricted. Um, what do you call it? So that that was that was the thing. Man, it feels like ketchup wise, it's taken not not ketchup like ketchup catsup, but like catching up wise. <laughs> um, right. It seems like it's been forever since we had like a show with the two because i know you weren't it's feeling like good a month. before yeah yeah you weren't feeling good before then i was at pax then, <laughs> then we had the patreon episode and now this is like the first one in a while yeah um yeah. and well, i guess yeah, i was gonna say the other thing i i was gonna i'm pretty sure you are as well for anybody looking to order stuff from bethesda store um i'm a brand ambassador thingy so <laughs> thingy? for what that's worth yeah i i will never stop being let down by <laughs> jargon like that oh my god and the screen at the we're both brand ambassador i don't mention this much on the shows because i'd rather have people support other sure, content sure. creators who, who really only value thing it more. i've ever done yeah mainly because for anybody who watches the video version um my backdrop is the bethesda gear store for the most <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i've, so it I've got some kind of, i've got more over there but yours is all like right there yeah yeah so yeah. it seemed kind of like look i don't usually do too much with this i was like maybe this is something i can do and i was like i'd like to see stuff early and i was like i wonder if we get to do any like neat stuff and i've already had a couple people test it out so i can confirm that it works um we're able to give discount codes so if you're gonna order anything yeah. from the store let one of us know so that we can get you a discount code uh because we're allowed to create them and have special ones um within time constraints and stuff like that so don't fit, pay full price if you don't have to because this stuff i would say it's a little expensive. I like it because the quality is always there from anything I've bought. Oh yeah. I would rather great. pay more and have something be well made than be cheap and crap. Um absolutely. But as a side effect, that does make it cost more. So the fact that we can do like discount stuff now, that's pretty cool. I was actually excited to to hear about that. And thanks to anybody who's tested it out for me, who was actually ordering stuff and they're like, Oh, yeah, it totally worked. I just put it in the code you gave me and it totally cut 20% off. And one person actually said that it pushed them down a tier on shipping. So it made their shipping cheaper too, because oh, nice. it was like, great, even better. That's awesome. So, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. If you're interested, uh, get use Lotus's code. I mean, you guys support the show through Patreon and, and I do a lot of things. I'm, you know, I love the support, but there are a lot of creators out there who are like trying to get their streams up and go in or, or Lotus sure. who does this on the side. It puts a lot of work into his videos and things. I'd, I'd rather that, like the, the little bit you get from supporting a creator through using their codes and stuff. I'd, I'd rather that go to other people. Yeah. Um, which I think that's, yeah. that's super nice of you. And I, I generally kind of feel this because some people do this. I actually, you do this as a living. I do this as a hobby. Yeah, so like, that's, that's the thing. Like a lot of times where it's like, Oh, I can do this. This and that. it's like, I super appreciate that's awesome. But 
if somebody else could use it to get by, yeah, that might yeah. be a little more important. So I also totally get that too. Yeah. 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 But, but uh, it's cool stuff. Yeah. Go check out yeah, what's is. on the store. It's very anything, cool stuff. Anything you guys like. Um, well, cool, man. Anything else? No, I think that's everything. Um, yeah. Just excited for the new, new chapter incoming of the high aisle. Much yeah. excitement. And the big, uh, Microsoft Bethesda showcase is on. Yes, June 12th. That's also interesting because I assume mm-hmm. that we'll get some Starfield actual stuff. I concretely, would, I would expect so. I mean, that's been their habit is yes. the, the June showcase, whether that's E3 or their own thing before the launch of a big game. Right is usually where we get actual gameplay and more details. And then we get like a summer of cool promotions and videos and all sorts of stuff that hypes us up for the game launch. So, um, so in the spirit of that, uh, Dave Chaffins and I have put out another uh, Starfield lore cast episode this week. (laughs) And, And we have fun with that. And we're covering some of the leaks that have come out and some of the info. So if you are not already following us on the Starfield Lorecast, go subscribe to it. It's up on whatever podcast you're listening to this on. We will be covering everything from this point forward. We've kind of done just episodes on occasion up until this point, but whenever yeah, but there's something new. you only deal in star facts. And all, yeah, the early episodes, we just made up crap because <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything to talk about. But now we're going to have, have legitimate things to talk about. And then uh, once the game actually launches in November, we will be going through all the lore, like dig into all the depths of everything we can find we'll be playing the game a lot but then also sharing as much as we can about the world and the planets and you know the world the universe (laughs) it's 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 a galaxy and uh planets and locations and the people and all sorts of different things so um and we're going to do it in a smart way we won't we won't spoil too much We, we will do a lot of the background stuff first so I've got that coming up. I've got the Lord of the Rings lore cast is up to episode 10, I believe this week uh, or nine, 10 might be coming out in, in Monday. Um, and then uh, let's see anything else I got going on. Oh, I've been writing music. I've been writing. Oh, I saw that. Music. I actually haven't gotten yeah. a chance to listen to that on YouTube yet, but I actually marked it so that I could. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> this is, I guess this is my midlife crisis. I bought a new guitar. <laughs> it's behind me back there. Uh, next to the Dova dude, you can see now you can tell how big Dova dude is compared to a guitar. He's that actually gigantic. Is true. For for context, that Dova dude is freaking <laughs> massive, freaking huge. I know, right? Like you can't tell distance to the wall, so it's hard to know. But then now that you see the guitar next to him, it's like, oh my god. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been actually writing music, uh, writing all the parts, the drums, the guitars, the keyboards, all the stuff, and. Um, I've been streaming it a little bit when I get time to stream it. And I think most of my four fun streams lately will be me making music and kind of hanging out with people while I'm writing and creating the music. Um, and the, the idea is that the songs are all going to be inspired by video games. So the first project is inspired by fallout. So the first song I put out, which I think is mostly done, I might tweak it a little bit more, but it's really close. It's really close. And that one's inspired by, uh, when you wake up in the vault in fallout four, And you realize that like everyone else is dead and your son is gone. So it's got this really kind of somber kind of emotional quality. And then the second song I'm writing, uh, which I I can show you guys after this, if you want, if you want to hang out is, uh, inspired by death claws. And it's, it's way more like rocking, like, you know, I don't know, dissonance and like heavy guitars because (laughs) freaking death claws. Right. So. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So come hang out with me. Uh, uh, all the stuff I do is on the Robots Radio channels, including this show, which streams on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. So you're welcome to come join us and chat like like our friends out here. Um, but Robots Radio, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, all those places. That's what I got going on. And go check out RobotsRadio.net. Lots of different shows on the network. The other shows that I do, the other Elder Scrolls shows, lots of different stuff. Go check that out. Um, Tales of Tamriel at this point. <laughs> yeah, Tales of Tamriel too. Yeah, Lotus <laughs> shows. Say, my other show. Yeah. <laughs> all of that stuff. So lots of cool stuff going on. Um, all right, guys, that's it for this week. Until next time, stay safe out there. And if you see a funny horned dude hunting you, run away. Or stab him with the spear a bit of mercy. There you go. That'll work. Or maybe you can win the hunt and then he'll just tear off his flesh and give it to you as a piece of armor you can wear. Sticky sweet. Oh boy. All right. See you guys later. Bye everybody. 
Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter at robots underscore radio or Lotus of Doom at Lotus of Doom. Also, you can join us on the Robots Radio Discord channel. You can easily just search Robots Radio Discord on Google or check the description underneath the podcast. Also, this podcast is recorded live every week on Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on the Robots Radio channels on Twitch, YouTube, and on Facebook. So just search Robots Radio on any of those platforms. Come join us. We'd love to chat with you while we record the show or before or after. Either way, just come hang out with us. And if you're looking for more information about my shows and the shows on the Robots Radio Network, go to robotsradio.net for all the information about all the shows on the network, including the Robots Radio Rocket Club, where I help both new and existing podcasters to grow their shows, build their audiences, and create the best podcasts they possibly can. All of that at robotsradio.net. We'll see you next time.